all the way from the USA. We are coming to you live by way of YouTube and uh, Facebook. Blessed be God, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. He's blessed us with, blessed us with another Sunday in uh, this century and uh, we are enjoying fellowship with one another and fellowship with him. So in case you miss any uh, portion of the live stream, please go to our webpage, libertyhouseusa.org. Once again, libertyhouseusa.org. Or go to our YouTube channel. Please type in Liberty House International Church and treat yourself to the videos that we have so you can be enriched spiritually and you begin to touch lives the way God has ordained it. Amen. My delivery is quite uh, unusual, so in case I say something that is not familiar with you, please let's not fight. I'm for you and not against you. I'm not here to be condescending or to, you know, get you offended. It's not my, it's not my intent. Alright, I love you dearly. And I want you to know that. Hallelujah. Alright, so I'm a messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ, an agent of change. And our business is we partner with the Lord or the Lord partners with us to transform lives through His Word. And that is what we do. So, we believe in truth, nothing else but the whole truth. Hallelujah. I thought you were going to put your hands together. Are you not excited about what I'm saying? Come on. Yes. That is very enthusiastic. Put your hands together. You are coming for me. Hallelujah. Yes, that's better. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. All right. So I've come to realize something. Why are we here? Or how did we get here? Question, how did we get here? That is something that, a question that you have to ask yourself from time to time. How did I get here? I've realized that, you know, not everybody's mind is programmed like a detective. Have you realized? Some people, if you give them the job of being a detective, no, 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 no. You harass them. Not every mind works like a researcher. Not everybody wants to go to the medical field. No, some people, I mean, they can't, they see a blood, I mean, tiny blood. When you go to the hospital, you are freaked. I mean, so they want to take some small blood for something. They can't even stand that. I understand some men passed out when they were at the delivery ward and they saw their wives giving birth. What? So I know a guy too who was uh, into uh, nursing. He had to change the program because he said, nah, I can't, I can't deal with the blood. I can't deal with the blood. You know, so everybody is wired differently. I'm trying to let you know that God did not make a mistake creating you. You are custom made. You are unique. You are very different. You are original. There are no two people or any other person on this earth like you. We are all well, human beings created by God, but we are uniquely yes. touched. Yeah. He has his word print on us Amen. in a unique, special way. Right. That is why the Bible says comparing yourselves with yourself mm -hmm. is something unwise to do. Yeah. Let's have that scripture. I know it's in Corinthians somewhere. I don't remember. Please help me out. Because it says when you compare yourselves with yourselves, uh, that's unwise. Please Google it. Let's have it out. But that's second Corinthians, but I don't remember. You know, so what we do is we compare ourselves. Well, you are not wired, you are not programmed the way somebody is programmed. Yet you want to function like the person. Okay, let's read it. It's now on the screen. So second Corinthians chapter 10. What is it? 12? 12? Okay, read. For we dare not. Oh, come on, come on. Let's not read like we are in the, some kind of school I don't want to mention. <laughs> read. We. Oh, I will. Forgive me. Let me do it right. I left out the form. Let's read again. Read. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who are commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. No wise. Is that not what we do at times? Ah, oh, it's been 10 years. Look at where I am. I know this uh, guy here, this colleague, he just came into the company. He's done this, he's done that. He's gotten this, he's gotten that. 
Oh, I was born even before this guy. I don't know. I don't know. I attended his uh, big dedication and whatever. Look at him. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Oh, I think I'm better positioned than, than this person. But how come they've been able to do this and able to do that? Now, we, we are not in people's hurt. And whatever they do, we can tell. We only see the fruit of it. So they may be using crooked methods, we don't know. They may be using normal methods, we don't know. That's why it says, fret not. Or don't fret yourself when you see the wicked prosper. So some people prosper by normal means, approach, and what have you. But we have to understand that some people also prosper and they succeed in this life by doing things that are not cool. Can you say amen? Amen. So here, we have to understand that there's the timing of the Lord. I don't know why he held the womb of uh, Elizabeth. When you read that story, it's amazing. Look at the one. They were righteous people. They had done no wrong. And yet, they they were finding difficulty having what? Children. I know if you were in Africa somewhere, they would say your great, great, great grandmother. It took your name to some shrine, to a place or whatever. There's something done against you. That's why. But you see, it was all about the timing of God. Can you say timing of God? Why? Because both parents did not know that the plan of God, according to the counsel of God, their son, John the Baptist, will be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. They didn't know. But according to the time God had appointed, it happened. He opened Elizabeth's womb. And what do you mean before, before that happened? And the angel announced it. Zacharias was so much shocked. He was so shocked. If God didn't shut his mouth, he would have committed blunder. It would be so negative, it wouldn't even be funny. So his mouth, he couldn't even talk anymore. So he won't confess negative things. Some of us, we are killing God softly. And we are killing the vision softly by the things we say. We are not on the same page with God. We have to be on the same page with God. Amen. This is not too much. Amen. You have to just read the word one day at a time. Amen. If you can't read the whole chapter, it's five verses that you can read. Just read. Amen. Tomorrow, go back. Continue. Read. Even two verses. Read. And as you continue to do it, it will become what? A habit. It becomes part and parcel of you. The more you go into it, the more you come uh, into knowing the will of God. Not just the will of God for your life, but it comes to a place of understanding how God works. And so you realize you realize that you are growing, you are maturing. And certain questions that you, you used to ask, you even ask anymore. Because you find the answers in his word. Truth. And you are better positioned in life. Now that helps boost uh, what your confidence. You realize that now when you walk around, if you, you walk in self pity, that is gone. You don't throw those parties anymore. Amen. You walk around and there's a leap in your step. Yeah. And the people are wondering, this, this girl or this uh, man yeah. is crazy. Yeah. Look at, look at, look at. What, 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 what do they have going on? Why are they leaping? Right. You know? No, it's Jesus. Amen. Christ in you, the hope. The expectation of glory and the desire of the righteous shall be granted. Some of us, the desires that we have, I'm still working on it. It will happen one day. I'm still in the process of writing. I've come to realize that it's not my time. So, like somebody said, oh, by the time I turn 50, by the time I turn 60, I should have done this, I should have had these books. If God hasn't told you that, don't push it. I've learned by wisdom, so I don't push things. And saying that, you know, I have a lot of songs that I can have a whole two scenes, whatever. It's only for now that one song. You know some of the songs. We sing it. We sing them here. Yeah. It's only one song now that is copyrighted and then also what? It's mastered. And we are in the last, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, phase of uh, the mastering. You know, the promotion aspect and whatever. Yeah. So you're going to hear the songs going to come up. 
Yeah. You guys, you've heard some of you heard me I talk about this. Does these songs have to come out? These songs have to come out. It's taking all these years. You know how how many years I've received this song? And I've tried. Pastor Kugosa and I, one time we traveled all the way to uh, Brunswick, New, New Brunswick, New Jersey, to see the possibility of doing recording and all that. It didn't happen. We got to another place together. It didn't happen. And at times when I begin to move, it doesn't happen. I realize that mm, time, 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 time. Yes. Time. Yes. Time, time. But when you walk with the Lord, you come to understand some of these things. That in His time, He makes all things beautiful. He can use your power, you know, and push some doors open. But it's always beautiful when God Himself opens the door. You have like a red carpet when the door is open. Hallelujah. Why am I saying this? Because we might be in some places and you say, How come? I've served God all these years. This is not happening for me. That is not happening for me. There's, you know, if you are looking for things that are not happening, you always find them. David was so wise. He said, I'll bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Don't let the devil fool you. Don't let him frustrate you. Oh, you are serving God and this hasn't happened for you. You claim yourself, what kind of God is that? And some people are trying to have audacity. They will tell you that, oh, you mean some people are not serving for you? Look at you, but look at me. I don't even serve the God you claim you say. Then they will say, look, I can take you to where my God is. And he can do for you what you have been waiting for, quickly. But you see, during all this time, he's working on us. And what he's working on is character. So we'll come to a place where we are conformed to the image of his dear son, according to Romans 8.29. That's why I love the Joseph story. Joseph's character had to be conformed to the image of his dear son. So he was in a place he was trying. Look at all that he went through. There was no bitterness, not an iota. Unforgiveness, not an iota. He came to a place where he appreciated God. He teamed up with God. And eventually, it happened. He worked in places that if he had his own choice, he wouldn't have worked. That's why he was taken as a captain to a place to work. And some of us, that's how we behave. If something doesn't force us, and I'm talking about a situation, because you know me, I can't force you. You know? You know, you know, right? Can I force you? No. I can't make you do anything. But God knows how. You know, he allows situations, circumstances. They don't come from him though. But the circumstances, they come our way. The challenges come our way. The one we push and push and push and push with our minds, with our own smartness, with our ability and everything. With our God in the picture. We think, oh, we know where we are going. I don't know. I've been doing this for years. I don't know. And then when we get to the place we can't do it anymore, we realize that now, now I've come to my work the end of my own smartness. Then we go back to God. That is where God can be glorified. Because you know, as I know, certain things, if they have come through for us, you walk around, you tell other people, you, you, why can't you be smart like me? And I just took this step and I did this and I did that. I went here and I went there and this happened. That is why motivational speaking in the church, the body of Christ is so bad. And when I talk about this, I want to say something. I have to say it. It's not no demeaning statement. People started talking about, oh, what is your five-year plan? What is your what is your ten-year plan? If God hasn't given you a five-year plan, don't allow any motivational speaker to put pressure on you to go into a five-year plan. You will frustrate yourself. There's planning that is spiritual. Jesus said, if you're going to build a house, you first sit down to count the cost. That's planning. It gives you wisdom to do that. But I'm talking about that is that which is outside the word of God. And if I say something that I'm going to say to be like I'm being mean, I'm not being mean, I'm not being insensitive, but I want to say it. Somebody who structured his life, talk about this for years. He structured his life, and I think he had some what do you call, uh, some sources and he had some productivity going. 
It was very popular. I've known all over the world, written books and what out there, his tax lives and all that. So he talked about this. And then what happened? Uh, he came out with a 10 year plan with his ministry, with his family, everything intact. 10 year plan. This is what I asked myself. This 10 year plan, did God give him? Is it from God? You see, at times, ambition can get into your heart and you think it's vision from God. There's difference between ambition and a vision from God. A vision from God will humble you. A vision from God will let you realize that, wow, you are so inadequate. So I'm telling you something. You know at times how we do it? When you walk around and you feel within yourself, I'm not that. You may not say that. But you know within you are feeling your power. Please be careful. Please be careful. When you think you are doing something, it's working. Probably you are, amb- you are ambitious. Why? Because when is this thing from God is bigger than you, Amen. and it's going to be bigger than your resources, Amen. and God will have to give you what well, resources, Amen. and He will have to give you personnel for this thing to happen. Yes. And most of the time, some of the personnel are people that you don't want to even interact with. You don't want to go to them for any help or assistance. I'm telling you something that is deep. You just don't select people. Oh, this guy looks good. And this guy, yeah, so I'm done. No, but God places people in your path of purpose. Regarding his counsel for your life to help you. They might not look all that. They might not look all that. They might not look like people who have what it takes. But if God brings them your way, you better accept them. I've been telling you, every time I have uh, the opportunity to share with pastors, this is one of the things I tell them. I said, look, you may be looking for a crowd in your church. You may be looking for numbers. Even though God moved from numbers. I mean, he started with Genesis. He came to what? Exodus, Leviticus, then numbers, then what? Deuteronomy. He moved into Acts. But people are still counting. They want numbers. But I said, the people that you have now, what are you doing with them? Because whatever God is going to do with you, where you are and what he's going to do, the people that he's giving you, those are the people that are going to get you to where you need to be. Come on, say amen to them. But they don't think that they're looking for somebody else. They have people within them, but they don't see what is in the people that God has given them. So they're always looking for somebody from somewhere to come to help them in their vision. Jesus had just the twelve. He picked them. One decided not to go alone. But he worked on this twelve. And look at look at history. Just the twelve. You don't need much. Gideon, that story in the Bible tells us something. When God was going to work with him, he picked what? 32,000 people. Wow. Say wow. Say it uh, so loud, so if somebody's sleeping by your side, you wake up. (laughs) (laughs) 32 or 1,000. And the Lord said, no, these people, they are too many. So anybody who is fearful, this is what I keep saying. You think you have a crowd, but not everybody is well positioned. Not everybody is on the same, what, uh, what, what was the name? level with God, in agreement with God, unity in purpose. No, it's not there. It's not there. Jesus even said concerning his ministry, he said, you guys are following me because of what? The food. (laughs) Their heart was not for him. The moment he says something, that I'm the bread of life, unless you eat my body, well, ah! They are gone. You know, they like the food he was giving them, not his flesh. (laughs) But that was, that's not what he was referring to. So Gideon, he realized that those who were fearful and whatever, they were how many? Because he was left with 10,000. 22,000. You had 32, and only 22,000 were not with you. But this is the case all the time. In any local assembly, there are people there who are not one leg in, one leg out. That's why we always refer to something as the faithful few. Those ones are committed. They are for the ministry. They are, they, they, what do you call it? How do I say? 
They've accepted the vision of the house. They've tied their vision to the vision of the house. I call something vision within your vision. And I'll be preaching about it. I'll be talking about these things for you to understand. Because nobody's vision stands by itself. The order of God, the principle of God, the system of God, your vision always stands within somebody's vision. And people don't understand it. And at times, we are looking for, I used to say this, somebody said, oh, the day I'll come into contact with Oprah Winfrey, the way I'll serve her. No, probably your thing is not to serve Oprah Winfrey. Never to even come close. But you see, your own desire, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey. So if you even pray and telling God, if you don't connect me to Oprah Winfrey. If, no, but this is what we do at times. Witchcraft prayers. It has nothing to do with the will of God for you. You see, like I always say, when I was going to marry, I didn't say, I want a girl with guitar shape. I want a girl with a Coca-Cola shape. I want a girl with this. You know, no, I didn't come out. A girl from this particular tribe and from this kind of ethnicity and whatever. No, I said, God, whatever is your will is what I'm looking for. I'm ready for that. I'm ready for that. And that is how we should be positioned. Ready for the will of God. But as I'm talking to you, some of you, you know. Okay, let me start with the ladies. Because I wear high heels, a short guy is what I don't like at all. How can I walk with a short guy and I'm on heels and I'm taller than the, you know, I'm taller than my husband? No, you are not saying that. Why are you doing that? <laughs> Why are you doing that? <laughs> my goodness. And with the guys, they always have their own way, the kind of person. They don't talk about character first, it's about physique, how the lady should be. And that is so wrong. I'm saying that to let us know that we can be selfish. Or we can be carnally minded instead of being spiritually minded. So growth and renewal of mind is about always adjusting, deprogramming and reprogramming yourself the way you think with the word of God. That's it. The more you do it, the better you become. You realize that you'll be able to accept people, you'll be able to relate with people easily. And when even you are going through challenges, it's easy. I'll share this with you. Now, you can see two people. They can be faced with the same situation, and one would uh, what behave or respond differently. Yeah. What's the difference? They are all Christians. Yeah. But the other way, you said it, maturity. One is mature. So they are going through. But they are, they are not going to freak it out. I'm even losing my mind. Now what is this? And, no, no. They will become like nothing even is going on. And say hallelujah, praise the Lord. The Lord has gone ahead of me. Yes. And then they can even say this too shall pass. Oh, this yes. has even passed. It's a testimony in the making. The Lord is with me. Yes. You know, we all feel things. But the way you take it, after feeling, I always say after feeling, go back to the drawing table, Amen. to what God has said. Yes. And begin to speak life. Amen. Amen. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Speak life. Speak life. Speak life. God never speaks death. He speaks life. Life is so powerful. When you speak it, when something needs to die, life will kill it. Yes. The word that came from Jesus towards the fig tree was life. But it killed the fig tree. That's what I'm saying. It's powerful. And we all at times we struggle with this when we are going through a special, when we are faced with something, especially when we have a time, time, you know, that we want things to happen. You realize that frustration is too much. And at times, look, I'm not telling you it's easy. You sleep, you sleep soundly, you wake up, then the first thing that comes on your mind, your situation. That why I didn't invite it. I understand that. Can you say that? I understand that. I understand that. But God has given you sound mind. So when that shows up, you deal with it. Yeah. Amen. So right away, you go to work. Yeah. I was talking to somebody who suffered injustice, laid off work. And the person said, Pastor, I must tell you, it wasn't easy though. The first week wasn't easy. And I said, yeah, no. Because we are work in progress. We are all at different levels. Yeah. You know, so all of a sudden, you have your plans. And all of a sudden, no, injustice is already harsh 
can get you angry. You can, if you are not careful, you want to kill. Don't do that. And then all your plans, you are out of income, just like that. That can be a tough place to be. Then you don't know where. If you are even going to work somewhere, you need a reference. And this evil has done you dirty. Where, where do you go from here? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But all things work together yes. for our good. Yes. You may not understand it, yes. but it's working for your good. Amen. Thank you. So what do you do? You go back to the word. Disappointment. Go back to the word. You fail. Go back to the word. Work with the word. Amen. The word of God works, Amen. but it doesn't work until you work it. Yes. It's so powerful, but it doesn't become powerful by way of experience until you do something about it. You apply it. Amen. That's why some people are confused. Oh, but I've been saying the word. Somebody can say the word without conviction, persuasion in their heart. That is why I teach the way I teach. And I'm going to touch some of these things. That's actually what I came to talk about. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. I don't have much time. I'll do what I can. Romans chapter 5 from verse 1. How did we get here? You know, most of us, we hear things, we don't even examine them. Do you know that? We see things, we don't even question, and we are just, we are, you know, we are flowing with it. We are getting along, you know, right along. From verse one, let's read together. Read. Yeah. If, let me tell you this: if you if you participate in this well, and you are not taking my time, I can stop in about what ten minutes time. But if you take my time, I'll be adding on. I promise you that. So we are going to read together. You still love me? <laughs> oh my. Read. Therefore, oh no, no. Let me tell you some funny story. I went to do my physicals. <laughs> this is a bonus. <laughs> you know why I remember this? Because of the way I was laughing. I laughed so I kept laughing. I kept laughing. The nurse said, Stop laughing. <laughs> she wanted me to be sad about it. I said, No. I said, Look. And that, that, that is uh, one of the things I do to keep my sanity. Right. Because why should you stop me from laughing? You are lamenting about somebody, but me, I see it funny. Then he said, This is not funny. <laughs> I see it funny. I laugh. Hallelujah. It keeps me going because our family and destruction, you should laugh. That's what Bible says. So I do that. Hallelujah. <laughs> now let's go, get back to reading. Read. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'll ask you the question, how did we get here? We've been justified by what? Faith. I don't have time to open scriptures, but I'll tell you much as much as I can. Because you heard me talk about some of these things. Look at the second verse. Through whom also, we're talking about Jesus Christ, Right? Through whom? Your yes is not powerful. Let's go back to verse 1. Because like you didn't see it. Verse 1. We we be justified by faith. We have peace with God. Through whom? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 2. That's how you read. You know, you let it stick. The Holy Ghost is your remembrance. He makes things stick. But some of you, the things that stick are not okay. He insulted me. She insulted me. She did me dirty. And that's what is stuck. No, don't be stuck on. Okay. Read. Through whom also we have what? Access by what? Faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory. Now, through whom? Jesus Christ. Key. Through Jesus. Key. Through Jesus. Now, another thing that I want to bring to your attention is this. We have access into the grace of God. How? By faith. Yeah. Amen. By faith. Can you say by faith? by faith? Now let's go to verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by what? Faith. faith. That is key. Yeah. That is key. If you meet any pastor anywhere, if it's possible, 
Depending on what they talk about, no, I don't want to do that. So, so I leave that alone. By faith is by faith. What is that faith about? What is faith? Let's see the definition. I can tell you that it's easy. It's total reliance on Christ. Amen. You entrust your life to Him Amen. for your spiritual and whatever well being. That's it. Amen. We are talking about truthfulness of God. You are leaning on Him. But you see, you can't find God anywhere. You can't see Jesus anywhere. He lives sometime back, but we're not born. All right? But now he's left us with his word. His word is the same as he himself. Isn't that cool? Yes. His word is the same as he himself. His word and himself, they are not separable. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. So if you take his word, whatever he told people when he was alive, and it happened for them, Whatever he's saying through his word now, if you obey it, it'll work for you too. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So you see, Jesus never walked around with prayer shows and giving to people who came to him for assistance. Have you realized that? Why is the church now distributing prayer shows? And they are telling them that if you pray with that, it's so foolish when I see people have it around them in conference, they'll use it. And when they are praying and whatever, what you see, now you have put your trust in. The, in, in some fabric, yeah. cloth, piece yeah. of cloth. Yeah. Probably whoever promised you that he, he put power in it, whatever, probably nothing. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Nothing. It's nothing. But your faith now is that, oh, I have this thing on me, so I'm protected. I'm praying with this. And even the Jewish system, you know, Jesus came to, uh, what do you call it? I would use a strong word, abolish, because he fulfilled the law to bring an end to it, to start something new. So he never told them to pray with talif or prayer show. You know the foolish teaching. Some people say, Jesus said, when you pray, enter into your closet. So that is the prayer cloth. When you cover yourself with that, it's a prayer cloth. I've been praying years since I got home again. I've never covered my head before. I'm not about taking the cloth, my mommy's cloth, and cover my head before. My prayer goes straight to my father. So that's a lie somewhere. And I've seen some things. I've not seen everything that I want to see, but I've seen some things. You be in this house, you know what I'm talking about. We've seen some things. So if I have to cover myself with Talif, have you realized I've never talked about prayer shown to you before? Come on. Have you realized that I've never said anything about prayer Talif that you have to get into prayer with before? Yeah, because it's not present truth. If they use it, mosaic, that is past. That doesn't mean you should use it. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Back when we call something spiritual churches, they wear white gowns and some other gowns, they wear colors and all that. They are into the mosaic. They don't even know. And when they are there, it's easy for other spirits to just get in. So at times people can't tell the difference. They are being used by some kind of spirit from the kingdom of darkness. And they don't even know. You know, they'll tell you that they... They take off their sandals or uh, shoes to go worship because God told Moses, where your son is holy ground, take off your... It's, it's in the Bible, but it's not to be practiced. Do you understand what I'm saying? In the mosaic, to go to the temple, of course, you have to wash your feet and whatever, whatever. so that's fine. And uh, some people even reason, some scholars, that that time, because of walking, riding donkeys and their, their droppings, you know, when you walk, you collect stuff, so that was why they were doing it. Fair enough. Whatever, whatever, whatever. It's fast. Whatever the reason is fast. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. But people are still doing it today. And they say in heaven, people are wearing white robes. You know, it's, it's typically or it's a type of the righteousness that we have upon ourselves. Because Jesus gave us that righteousness. You don't have to wear a white gown. When you take it off, does it mean that you are no longer holy or righteous? So what is faith? Acting on the word of God, talking about truth. Go on and act about taking off your sandals. Before you pray, you kneel down in your own bedroom and say, because you've taken off your shoes. I mean, now God sees that you are humble. That is no humility. It's actually pride. It has nothing to do with taking off shoes. Humility has nothing to do with taking off shoes. Hallelujah. Amen. When we talk about faith, we are talking about persuasion. Like it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God risen from the dead, you say that is persuasion. Romans 10 9. You see, it's persuasion. You see, 
Some of you, you've been here for some time. You are persuaded that your pastor is an honest one person. Amen. Your man was in that. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. You are convinced by yourself. You are persuaded by yourself that you are not a thief. I thought you were going to say a louder amen. I was sending you out. <laughs> Am I right? You are convinced. You know that. You know that about yourself. You are convinced. You are persuaded about your name. When we talk about faith, that's how it is. You know that you know. To the point that you rely on it. You depend on it. You lean on it. You apply that to your life. That's what it is. Hallelujah. Amen. So, look at this. We came into this where we are. The grace of God is by faith. Because uh, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 says that we are saved by grace through faith. And I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. We are saved by grace through what? Faith. The faith factor is very, very important. Now, we are shifted from faith and we are doing foolish things. In the body of Christ. Foolish things. And I want you to be aware of. Jesus never even gave anybody. He didn't even carry oil with him. And he dipped his finger in oil to pray for people when they came to him for prayer. Now we have gone overboard. Though we can pray for the sick for, uh, according to James chapter 5, we can pray for the sick, lay hands on them with uh, anointing them. We've gone overboard. Telling people that when you anoint yourself with the oil, you are protected. Where you work, when you go there, your business place of work, you anoint it, you are going to prosper. Anoint your wallet, anoint your pocketbook, you are going to prosper, and stuff like that. Anoint your pillow, demons will go away from you, and all that. What is this? I want you to realize what I'm saying. And some of these things have gone on for ages. I want you to realize it. For years. And it's still now, it's becoming more popular. I've been to a church like that before. They call something holy water. They will bless it for you to go and drink. They believe that if you drink, it will cure your sickness. It will protect you to do everything. At times, you have to even sprinkle some in your home. It will ward off uh, demonic activities and demons. Have you heard that before? Yeah. yeah, I know what I'm talking about. Now, the church has come to that. They call it blessed water. Am I right? Or anointed water. And people are buying it. Some people will travel from one, one country to another country, or even make somebody send it to them, mail it to them, or whatever. What is this nonsense? You have the simplicity, the simple word of God that you have to accept it, and it works for you. You don't want that. You want a thing to put your trust in. Put your trust in the word of God. Yeah. Your confidence should be in the word of Amen. God. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'm going to touch on this one too because I can't talk about it without touching it. Fasting is one of the things that has hurt the church seriously. Because Romans 6 uh, 23, it says, For by what? For the wages of sin is what? Let's put it there. The wages of sin is what? By the free gift of God. The gift of God is what? Now, so we came into the faith, the gift, Holy Spirit, soul by faith, gift. So how come? The way we've come in by faith is the same way everything from God that we have received, we are going to maintain. Right. It's never by fasting. Right. I can't say that enough. Fasting didn't save you. Fasting didn't give you the Holy Spirit. And then people say that it's one of the dis disciplines of uh, Christianity. Well, I'll give them that everyone will say that. But now let me know the things that uh, you fast for or why you do this fasting thing. Let me know. Do you get what I'm saying? Because if it's by faith and it's not instructed you to fast, then why do you do the fast? Go to uh, John chapter 2. Let me show you something. People say fasting is a way of humbling uh, yourself before God. It's a lie. It used to hold in Old Testament. By the new covenant, fasting is not a way to humble yourself. And I'll show you, I'll show you that. John chapter uh, 2 from verse 1. I'm not there, but we'll read it and uh, let's see something there. On the third day, there was a uh, Joel. J-O-E-L. 
chapter 2 from 1. Let's read. read. Come on, come on, and let's do it, uh, you know, enthusiastically. Read. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy war mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. This guy is the prophet who prophesied about the last days and the Spirit of God will be poured upon all flesh. Okay, let's read. That's verse 28, but we are not going there. Continue, verse 2. Read. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of what? Clouds and thick darkness. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come. No, wait. A people come. Wow. Great and strong. The like of whom has never seen been for <laughs> nah. okay even for my successive for many successive generations okay let's read on thank you jesus a fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns the life the land is like mm -hmm, before them and behind them a desolate wilderness surely nothing shall escape them next verse the appearance is like the appearance of horse of horses and like okay. okay we see that when we are reading the bible we have to first establish who is speaking okay who is the audience and we are talking about looking at the dispensation so this has nothing to do with the church because the church was not born yet all right i'm going to i'm going to give you the, the specific chapter that i'm looking for um where are we joel what is it i can't find joel in here okay so two i'm going to give you the exact scripture where it says Rend your heart and not your garments. And I'm going to tell you something about that. Um, verse 13. Verse 13. Paul says, Now, therefore, says the Lord. I want you to know who's talking. Now, therefore, says the Lord, Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. So, this is what some preachers use till now, they use it. They refer to this and tell you that that is why you have to fast. Okay? So it says, look at the next verse. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great what? Kindness. And he relents from his from doing harm. So those times when they fast, that's a way of repentance. You have to put on, uh, you take off your clothes, you put on a uh, uh, what is it? Sackcloth. And you put ashes. You know, you are humbling yourself. You are uh, humiliating or afflicting your soul, as it were, to prove to God that you are repentant. Okay? You have a change of mind or whatever. But we see these same people, they'll fast, the next day is different. Anytime they are in trouble, then they go back. But God has done something so beautiful that I think it's not appreciated enough. Can you imagine each time you sin, you have to go to God to repent, you fast, you put on sackcloth, and then you do that. So if we are not doing the sackcloth, that's not how we repent. Why are they still tagging or talking about the fast? What you have didn't came by fast, it's not going to be maintained by fast, it's not going to continue by fast, it's by faith. Hallelujah. Okay. So this was how they did it then. Because I don't have time, I want to jump straight to Luke chapter two, Luke chapter fourteen. Luke chapter fourteen. Look at the uh, verse twelve. I'm sorry. It should be eleven. I'm sorry. I'm done. <laughs> it says, "For whoever exalts himself will be one." 
humble. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. That same word is in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that same word is in the book of Matthew. All right? But whoever exalts himself will be humble. And whoever humbles himself. So let's find out. When we say, when Jesus said humble, how does one humble himself? Anybody here? Just tell me. Anybody, huh? According to the word of God. So it's not by fasting. Do you all agree that it's not by fasting? Oh, you are not sure. Because that is what's, that is what's being preached. That when you fast, that's a way of humbling yourself. Am I right? You've heard all this before. Who hasn't heard, heard that before? That if Jesus wanted to say fast, so you remain humble, he would have said it. But he didn't say it that way. Humbling yourself has nothing to do with fasting. Because fasting, if you should put it right, is just what? Abstinence from food. You are starving yourself. That's all. You, you choose to starve yourself. You choose to skip your meal. Now, what we are taught, addition, I didn't see it in the Bible, but addition, they say when you fast, you have to spend time with God. You have to read your word. You have to pray, right? You see, they are making things up for God. God doesn't need that help. Do you get it? But now, let's look at the word um, uh, exalt. Exalt <laughs> means to elevate yourself, to have an exaggerated opinion about yourself, to raise to the very summit of uh, opulence and uh, prosperity. So it's like you are lifted up. You know, you are puffed up. God doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to be humble before him. And then he says, if you do that, he will abase you. All right? Yeah. What does it mean? And I'm going to show you the word that is to depress, humiliate, <laughs> abase, bring low. That's, or make low, to make low. That's abase. Mm. And when you read First Peter chapter 5, it says that God resists the proud. So when you go your own way, you have already a wall that you are dealing with. Yeah. You will go, 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 go. You always hit the wall yeah. till you come back. That's God right. resists the proud. Mm -hmm. But he gives grace to the, to the humble. Jesus said it this way. If you are looking about how to humble yourself, let's read in uh, Matthew chapter 11, mm -hmm. 29. Matthew 11, 29. Have you found it? Have you found it? Is it there? Oh, gee, these people are not helping me. It's Matthew eleven twenty nine on the screen. Yes. yes, that's better. Why? Why do you do that, children? I'm going to show you something today. How many children we have in the building? Yeah. When you go home today and your parents are asking you questions, don't answer because they did it to me. You see? Because I asked them a question, right? That is uh, whatever on the screen. They were quiet. Mm -hmm. So when they ask you the first and second time, be quiet. The third time, then you answer. <laughs> just for today. Just for today. <laughs> and all the parents, if you ever say, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hallelujah. Amen. I just said that to make a point. Okay, so 29. Let's read together. Read. Take, take, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Wait. Learn from me. Something has changed. Now the instructor, the leader, the guide, the professor, the lecturer is Jesus. He says, learn from me. Don't go back to the old ways of doing things. Something new has started. So learn it from me. The way I do it. Learn from me. Can you say amen to that? I know you are thinking, but well, you see, the word of God is the word of God. But like I said, the word of God is the word of God. But not, not every word is to be practiced. You can say Solomon was warned not to go after the strange woman. He did. He had thousands of them. So he said, well, it's in the Bible. Solomon had those two strange women. No, me too, I can go. But then he said, oh, no, no, that, that is way too hard. No, everything is like that. Let's deal with the principle. Hallelujah. Amen. So we learn from Jesus. Do you all agree with that? Yes. If we learn from him, 
He says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. When Jesus came about, when you let, let I'm too close. I'm telling you but you know that Jesus he never preached anything about the mosaic. If he was preaching, he was pointing out to the new covenant. In Mark chapter 1, if you start from verse 14, he came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 4, 23, he went about the villages teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. A different message, not the law. That's why I say that when you go to a place and they are quoting the Old Testament, talking about Old Testament, and they don't interpret it in the light of the New Testament, right. they are putting you more and more further and further into bondage. Right. And I'm not surprised. That is why most of these people, they worship fasting. You may say you don't worship fasting. Fine, but some are doing the body of Christ. It's my place to keep teaching truth about it so people will come to know the truth. Amen. That is my place. Amen. To defend what is true in the light of present truth. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Some people are hustling in their what well, marriage, then you just have to fast and pray. Their business is going on going well. You have to have fast and pray. Everything fast and pray. And some people say hard times you use that. Certain demons, you know, can only confront them because by prayer and fasting. And they have been fasting for years. And we have to find out how many demons they've been able to cast out. They don't. They are not casting. They saw them actually they are afraid of demons. They don't cast anything out. They said they have to fast so you are ready in case you come across it. And they don't. And I know someone they have some demonic issues. They call on me. I know I'm not saying that to brag, but they say, well, I mean, that's not my area. No, everybody can cast out demons. Yeah. So for a pastor to say that is not my area, and you have to call some other uh, pastor friend to come do it, that is serious. The word of God is from uh, rev pro uh, revelation, line upon line and line, progressive revelation. Yeah. So some people are late. Jesus said, learn from me. So continue learning. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Continue. Now learn from this one. Learn this and begin to use it. But that's how people are doing. Amen. Anyway, to be continuing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So well, that brings me to the end of this uh, message. And I charge you with the words in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 and 13. Stand firm and deliver the world with Jesus. The anointed one has made you free. And do not be again entangled with the yoke of bondage. But by love, serve one another. Love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, any questions?